Welcome to a new series of teaching sessions that we're going to be putting online for the benefit of all of you watching at home. The idea with this teaching is that we want to take elderly care medicine, break it down into the 10 most important topics that we think that specialty involves and teach it in a way that makes it really accessible and easy to apply to the patients you might be seeing every day. Now, we don't want this to be just for doctors. I'm a doctor, but my colleague Georgie, who is also on this call, is a paramedic. We want this to be teaching that can be helpful for doctors, paramedics, nurses, physios, OTs, whoever you are within the MDT in the hospital. We want to try and teach you something more about looking after older patients. So with that in mind, we come to the first of our 10 topics, and that is multimorbidity. Now, multimorbidity is a term that you might or might not have heard of before, but it simply means when someone has two or more chronic health conditions, and those can be either physical conditions or conditions relating to their mental health. It can also involve things like alcohol dependence and learning disabilities too. So a lot of the people you might see in hospital, in particular older patients, they will often present with more than two conditions and as such will be defined as multimorbid. We have got a case study for you. So the case study is going to be brought up on the screen just now. Let's call our person Harry. Harry is an 86 year old man. He has been admitted to hospital with lower abdominal pain and unsteadiness on his feet. He has decreased appetite and increased urinary frequency. He seems restless and newly confused. He has been seen by four different GPs over the past year, and this is also his third hospital inpatient admission this year, under different consultants each time. He mentions that he doesn't eat much and says that he isn't a great cook, and that's the reason why. He's got a background of a few different conditions. He's got heart failure, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, osteoporosis, AF, a previous stroke, and is generally frail. He's on 10 different medications, and you can see those listed below. When you see him, he's tachycardic, his blood pressure seems stable, his chest is clear, but he does have notable lower abdominal discomfort. So how would you manage this patient? On each morning over the past week, and we're going to continue this for the next two or three months, we have been giving each of the elderly care wards, that is Newdigate, Horley, IRU, Smallfield and Kingsfold, a fact about the topic of the week and a question to help them think it through. So the first topic that we got the words to discuss last week was about how multimorbidity can be a cause of dependence. So the more health conditions somebody has, the more likely they are to be dependent on other people for their care. And statistics show that with every additional condition that somebody has, they are 20% more likely to be dependent on others for their care. So when somebody comes into the hospital, like Harry, for example, in our case study, with multiple conditions, I can't remember how many exactly, but it was at least five or six, you can see how much more likely he will be to be dependent on other people for his care, whether that is family members or a package of care that has been arranged for him in the community. So Harry in this story has no package of care. So what could be done? Well, we'd probably look at trying to get the physios and OTs to assess him and get the social worker to chat to him and see if he needs any extra support at home each day. The second subcategory that we looked at was medications. And in Harry's case, he is on quite a lot of meds and some of his meds could be doing him more harm than good. So we feel it's important that people review medications when older patients come into hospital as it might be our only chance to do so. GPs often don't have time in their very short appointments to scrutinize medication lists. So we are in a prime position to try and remove things that could be causing harm. And one thing that it's important to remember with older people is medications with a high anticholinergic burden. Now, I could go into a lot of specifics here and we could get bogged down in details, but basically medicines with a higher anticholinergic burden are more likely to cause older people to feel dizzy on their feet make them more prone to falls, make them more prone to confusion. They can lead to constipation, urinary retention, some of the things that Harry has presented with. And it may well be the case that in Harry's story, 
his medications could be part of the problem. So looking at his meds list, I would say that I'd want to ask him, did he really need his Zopiclone to help him get to sleep? Is the sertraline an appropriate dose for his mood? A few things like that. Even the amitriptyline, that's another one I'd probably want to see when it started and see if it still needs to continue at the dose he's taking it. Some of the main culprits in terms of causing these problems are antidepressants and antipsychotics. So we can see that in Harry's case, and those are common meds in lots of older people. They can be started sometimes because they've lost a loved one and because of a prolonged grief reaction, they're started on antidepressants and that's never reviewed. So these are important things to review, and we want to make sure that we are not causing the problem by giving meds rather than trying to prevent the problem. So... In our case study, we've seen that Harry has been seen by four GPs over the past year. Um, This is the third admission, and it's likely that under each of these admissions, he's had a different consultant. And that's a problem that is recognised in literature. Back in 2015, some GPs from around the UK wrote a piece for the BMJ that talked about how all GP practices should review their patients that have multimorbidity and allocate them a named doctor. This is something that GPs around the UK are trying to do and have been doing for about six years at least. Um, But it's something we should consider in hospital medicine too. So if you see your patient every day over a week, try and make sure that we're always having the same doctor see them as much as you're in, the same physio see them, the same nursing team take that bay, because they'll get to know that patient a lot closer. That means that we can build this rapport with patients and open up connections and communication. They might be more likely to tell us about the challenges and problems that they have at home or that they feel are inhibiting their trip home. So on Tuesday, we discussed about the risk factors for multimorbidity in the UK. And these are old age, female sex and poor socioeconomic status. Um, the onset of multimorbidity um, in patients who live in the lowest socioeconomic areas is seven years earlier than those who live in the areas of highest wealth. So this is a significant risk factor and it's something that we need to really consider in our practice. Having good local knowledge of the deprivation and population in which we work in East Surrey is really important for asking patients about their um, multimorbidity. So areas such as Rygate and Banstead have really high wealth and patients who likely come from Horsham have lived in the most well-off postcodes whereas areas of Crawley have much higher areas of deprivation sitting in the lowest three deciles of wealth in the UK. Um, Something that to read that's really useful and can help us really contextualise the impact of multimorbidity and deprivation is your local joint strategic needs assessment and we'll leave some links below this video. We've got a great team around at East Surrey Um, at the hospital with the physios and the OTs but also the community services as well which can liaise with patients and the teams here to explore the options of adapting homes, implementing care packages and helping people maintain independence for longer and live well. Sometimes having care packages at home can just help people achieve those essential daily living activities and keep that um, productivity in life. Um, It's really common for us to come into contact with people who don't have the financial or family support when you need those things in your later life and the health shouldn't suffer because of it but we know it can so it's really important that we ask those questions so in the case of our case study harry and um, we know he doesn't eat much he doesn't see himself as much of a cook um, but if we dig a few bit deeper ask a few questions we might find out that he's not able to make these meals because his wife died five years ago and he never cooked for himself really so he has to live on beans and toast Um, He's also been struggling with the stairs and therefore he talks about sleeping in the armchair, which we know is really, really bad for his health as well and cause cause a lot of comorbidities there. Um, His house might be cold due to the high cost of fuel, which is really important to consider given the fuel allowance has been cut for older people this year as well. So it's a really pertinent thing to ask about. So the last thing is frailty. Um, Frailty and multimorbidity are coexisting but they are not the same and it's really important that we remember this. In Harry's case he has both frailty and multimorbidity. So for Harry it means that he's less able to fight off infections, he's less able to deal with viruses. So half of frail patients have multimorbidity and 15% of multimorbid individuals have frailty and about 6% of the UK's population have both. This does vary. Um, In areas of the southwest it's as high as 9%. 
So for patients who are both frail and multimorbid, we need to make it a priority to try and reduce the multimorbidity burden. So tackling those medications, getting early care packages and making sure that we're really looking after those patients. Um, it means that we look at the patient as an individual with a really holistic assessment. So we're looking at both the social, medical and mental side of their health. Um, looking at how many tests and appointments are they going to? Can we try and get a couple of them in one day, somewhere like the Pendleton unit? Do they really need that extra blood test on the ward? Do they need the blood test daily? Or can it be left for a couple of days and we'll see how they are? Yeah, and... I think that last point that you just made there is really, really important about how we need to sometimes be rational and realistic with people in their 80s and 90s when they come into hospital for a while and we're sending them home. If they have a chest infection, do we really need to bring that 95-year-old back for a check x-ray in six weeks to see if their chest infection has resolved? Or do they need to go to that appointment with orthopedics after they've had... Um, some pain in their hip from osteoarthritis but they're too frail to be operated on sometimes it's worth just stepping back and as Georgie said seeing the whole person and thinking well actually this is going to be really difficult for them to get out of the house Harry here lives alone how will he get to the hospital are we putting him at risk of falls by asking him to come out in public transport and come to an appointment that he maybe doesn't need so I think all these questions are really really important to consider and I think, like you said about the public transport and things like that, I think this pragmatic investigation, isn't it? It's thinking about what is the benefit versus the the cost to the patient of that investigation. Um, and for a patient like Harry, it's, it's a, in the home circumstances, does he understand enough? Is he able to look after himself? He can't make meals for himself. Can he make a phone call to patient transport to organise the day on the right day at the right time to get to the appointment? That's a lot to do for someone who doesn't have family support, can't afford to ring a taxi. So it's a really big barrier to healthcare for him. So uh, in summary, just before Georgie introduces uh, the topic of the week for this week, um, I'll just rattle through those points once more. So in summary, what have we learned about multimorbidity? So first of all, multimorbidity can be a cause of dependence. It's important that when we're managing multimorbid patients, we have a close look at the medications they're on and make sure that we're not causing them more harm than good. With multimorbid patients, it's really important that we maintain good continuity of care. And whether that is having a named doctor that they always come in under whether that is having the same MDT member phoning family members each day, it's a useful thing to keep in mind so that we are managing them, managing them the best way we can. Fourth, low socioeconomic status is a risk factor for multimorbidity. And we should keep that in mind when we're seeing people with multimorbidity on the wards and think, are they struggling at home? And are there any ways we can help them? And finally, when patients come in with both multimorbidity and frailty, it's important that we consider the treatment burden that we're placing on them and look at ways to reduce that. Cool. So going into the next week, um, we're looking at DNA CPR decisions and uh, respect and advanced care planning. Um, so we're looking at just how we make these discussions, how do we broach it, um, and one of the barriers that we as health professionals feel um, there are when we are, when we need to ask questions about this because it's not really something patients often want to talk about not all patients are very proactive in thinking about that a lot like to not think about it so we've got a case study um that is should be on the wards with you for the week but we'll just quickly tell you about it so the case is a 72 year old gentleman called terry he's normally very fit and active he plays golf twice a week he was a retired policeman and now he does also does voluntary work at the charity shop. But he was uh, recently diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. And the CT last month shows a widespread to his liver and lungs. He's admitted to hospital today with COVID pneumonia. And he's slightly breathless at rest, but fully alert and orientated. You're the medical doctor admitting him and the ward solicitor asks if you've established his recess status before you finish your shift. What are you going to do? Who are you going to speak to? What do you say? Mm, good question. So we'll be back next week and every day on the wards. You'll see us um, to talk about this a little bit more. Yeah. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to doing another one of these videos for you this time next week.